Hey, Kyle Brand's Basement. We are not going to talk about Aaron Rodgers entirely. Not entirely about Aaron Rodgers, I promise. You probably need a break. I need a break. We are going to touch on a couple things. We are also going to talk about, did you ever call like a, a psychic hotline or a dating line or one of these asinine numbers down in the 90s and the 80s that would charge you $3.99 for the first minute, 99 cents for each additional minute. It pertains to one of the big quarterback storylines right now in the NFL, and we're going to talk about that, and we have great submissions from you. Plus, let's say you were on a basketball team, you played a really bad game. What do you think the team captain would play in the locker room after the game to punish you and make you take your medicine for playing such a bad game? We have the team, the player, and the band that people hate that was played in this story. It's a real thing. It's really happening. I promise it's not all Rogers. I promise that to myself. I love, I hate, I think things are hilarious. That's how we do it here. And we start with what I love. Come on! There's Aaron Rodgers' fatigue. I think from uh, people who don't like him for sure, I think people even who do like him, Packers fans, maybe even almost Jets fans, I think even Aaron Rodgers might have some Aaron Rodgers fatigue. So here's what I love. I love that at some point in a faraway place, in a galaxy far, far away, we will be able to talk about Aaron Rodgers on the field. I love it. See it down the road. Because he's going to join the Jets one way or another. It's going to happen. He's going to put on a New York Jets jersey and play a New York Jets football game. I think it's easy to get lost with Rodgers into all of the strangeness and all of the weird quirks and all of the sound bites and so many interviews and so much media all the time. It's easy to forget, oh my God, he is a professional football player and easily one of the best to ever live, ever. Especially right now in March. Like, oh man, we're in the beginning of the offseason. We're not even to the draft yet. He's going to not play for the Jets for six months. Let's try to focus on that. Because the divorce from the Packers, the nonsense here, the darkness retreats, anything you want to bring up about Rodgers, the most important takeaway from this week is that the Jets, the bleeping New York Jets, are going to get, in my opinion, the greatest quarterback to ever play. The best to ever do it. I don't care about titles, I don't care about resumes, take it all. The best to ever play the position, in my opinion, is going to become a New York Jet in maybe a matter of days, and then he's gonna play a football game for the New York Jets in a matter of months. It's going to happen. Let's focus on that, and I love that, because I'm happy for the Jets. I'm happy for Rodgers, he found something he wants to do. But let's just remember, there's gonna be a lot of stuff. It's always a lot of stuff with Rodgers. Even when the football begins, it's gonna be this avalanche, combined with a circus, combined with some sort of uh, wind tunnel nonsense, always. Even just in the history of Kyle Brand's basement, which started in September. Do you even wanna go down the yellow brick road with me of the stuff that we've covered with Rodgers? Let's do it. September 8th, Aaron Rodgers comes out and says, eh, every of the other NFC North teams say that this is our year and hasn't been the case during my time. Three days later, week two, Rodgers and the Packers lose the day in Minnesota. We used to do the show rounding up on Sunday night. Who lost the day? The Packers did. They lost to Minnesota. Says October 24th, hate in the I hate segment of the show. I hate the state of Rodgers and Brady. It was going terribly. Takes on takes. Chris Canty goes on ESPN on September, October 27th and says, stop talking, Aaron Rodgers. Stop talking. This is only October 27th maybe halfway through the season. November 17th, I love, I love that we get to watch Rodgers tonight on Thursday Night Football versus the Titans. They were four and six at the time. Football, there is football in there. December 15th, it was I hate. I hate that we could be witnessing the final weeks of Aaron Rodgers. I thought it was over. I thought we were circling the drain. Maybe they'll make a push to the playoff. They ended up not, but he's probably gonna retire, right? He didn't. December 20th, Back in the love segment. I love that I can't stop believing in the Packers. I thought they were making the playoffs for sure. They got smacked on their home field by the Detroit Lions in Aaron Rodgers' last game as a Packer. December 26th, day after Christmas, back in the love segments. I love that Rodgers and the Packers are for real. <laughs> they weren't for real, dummy. At least a lot of that is football. A lot. And then in the off season, since that's that we've talked about darkness retreats and decisions and all that stuff. If you look through that history of Aaron Rodgers on this show, there's some weird stuff, there's some off the field stuff, but there is a lot of football and I promise there will be more football for Aaron Rodgers. It's tough to look through the jungle right now because there's gonna be a lot of BS. Believe me, we will get to the football. 
as much as we can talk about the wonkiness of his departure from the Packers or the strangest of what he chooses to do with his off the field time, the headline here, the bedrock, the anvil of this story is that the New York Jets got one of the best quarterbacks to ever live. He's going to be on their team. That's happening. He's a football player. He's coming to New York. That's what I love about it. Let's get, though, to what I hate. You can have Lamar Jackson as the quarterback of your team. He's there. Four o'clock yesterday, 24 hours ago, phone lines were open, standing by. Come and make us an offer. We will leave Baltimore if they don't match it. And you can start selling those number eight jerseys. You got a superstar. And the silence is deafening. All you can hear is the crickets. If there's been calls to Lamar since four o'clock yesterday when it became actually legal and allowed, we haven't heard anything. I'm not hearing anything from Rappaport, Schefter, et al. The Ravens don't have to match squat. They have to sit and watch other teams maybe call or maybe not call. But I always have been bringing this up a lot in the morning is that procedurally the thing is fascinating with Lamar. Let's say you are a team and you're like, you know, we'd like to make a very competitive offer to Lamar. We'd like to offer him such and such million dollars and guaranteed. Let's reach out. With the no agent thing, which has been talked about a lot, what is the number? Like is Lamar's number to Lamar Jackson? Is it his cell phone? Does he have an office? Does it go to his mother? Does it go to a lawyer? Does it go to a manager of some kind? Who, is in, who, who answers the phone? I don't know. There's always been this legend about Bill Murray that if you have a movie you want him to be in, he has no agent and you call this voicemail box and you basically leave a message there saying who you are, what your business is and maybe what your project is and then maybe Bill Murray calls you back. Now that's been the legend for 20 years, maybe even longer. Lamar seems kind of be that same way. I don't know. Who answers the call? I have no clue. Is it a voicemail box like we have here in the basement? Is it a payphone? Is it just is it private or is it just his cell phone? Is it a pager? I don't even know. How does someone do that? Because we've had other guys represent themselves, but nobody of this stature, no one of this kind of money, kind of a big deal. So this morning I was talking to Good Morning Football and it was leading to me to think about hotlines. Is there a, is there a, like a one eight hundred four Lamar or yes Lamar that you call? And it brought me back to the idea that if you're calling Lamar right now, it could potentially be a $231 million phone call. Because if we're going off of the Browns and the Deshaun Watson thing, there's a $230 million thing. And if you suppose, as I do, that Lamar wants what he got and more, because if you go by the knowledge that Deshaun got that, so Lamar thinks I'm a better player, I deserve more, you're looking at, all right, more is $231 million guaranteed. So to make that call, to make that deal, is that a $231 million phone call? It feels like the answer is yes. And I was hearkening back to the year 1991 when I was a, uh, a tweener, an adolescent, and I had seen these commercials on my favorite wrestling show to call the Hulk Hogan hotline. And I went into my mom's bedroom and she had, like everybody did back in the day, a little bedside table with a little phone on it and a cord. And you sit down on the thing and you pick it up. Doo, 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 doo. And I called the Hulk Hogan hotline. Called it. And uh, I, had, I had remember seeing the commercial. And there was this uh, very, uh, very, very strict policy that the Hulkster had where he said, All you little Hulkamaniacs, make sure to get your mom and dad's permission before you call. And you called up, and the second you called, it was like, hey, everybody, this is Hulk Hogan here. And he, he played the music. And I was, on the, I was on the call, and you played a game where you hit a number to do a move and a number of this. Well, you know what? Why don't we just take a look back at the Hulk Hogan hotline? Somehow it pertains to Lamar Jackson. This is what I called the 1991. How could I not? Hey, dudes, Hulk Hogan's running wild on the WCW. <laughs> and I want to tell you about it right now. Call the Hulk Hogan hotline, 1-900-737-HULK. It's got eight incredible options, like Beat the Hulk, Hulk Trivia, and one of my great Hulk messages. There's always something new on the Hulk Hogan hotline. <laughs> Call now, 1-900-737-HULK. Call cost $1.49 per minute. Kids get parents' permission. Charges will appear on a parent's phone. <laughs> See that part at the end? Charges will appear on parents' phone bill, little hoaxsters. Look at all the legalese that was on the bottom of that. It took up the whole page. I don't think, I think I call the prior iteration of the Hulk Hogan hotline. I think the number was different. And notice he said the WCW. I was back in WWF, but it's the same concept. And I like that you can do Hulk Hogan trivia or one of my great Hulk messages. Imagine the message, how stupid it probably was. But you call and you pay money and it was awesome if you were 12. I did it. 
And then about two weeks later, my mom called me into the little, uh, wherever she, kitchen table, and she's paying bills with a checkbook. And she says, what is this? And she shows me this phone bill, and it says straight up on the bill, Hulk Hogan hotline, and it was $27 phone call. And I did what we all do, which is blame it on one of my friends who had come over. Oh, it must have been Parker. He did it. Well, I got in trouble for it. I had to pay it out of my allowance or something like that. And it just brought me down this wormhole of expensive phone calls. $231 million versus $27, largely different. But I feel like the second I said it this morning, people started being like, oh yeah, man, I call hotlines. I used to call this one, I used to call that one. So we did what we call in the old industry a social call out. What is the non-sex version of a dumb hotline that you called, and it's always the same setup, $2.99 for the first minute, 99 cents for each additional minute, and we asked, and you tweeted back. You've called some hotlines, bring them in. We do this for Lamar Jackson. Mateo says, I'll see your Hulk Hogan hotline. <laughs> and raise you a DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince hotline calls for a big time grounding that this guy got back in the day. I bet they rapped on the call and the commercial and Jeff and Fresh Prince. And isn't it perfect that your parents would ground you for calling those guys? Because parents just don't understand. Next tweet. Great job, Mateo. I did not call that hotline, but I would have. Michael Hoff says, Oh, I called the Ninja Turtles number roughly a quarter of a million times back in the day. Cowabunga, dudes! Make sure to get your parents permission. Call 1-800-4-TURTLES and we'll get tubular and talk about pizza and the Foot Clan. That's awesome. I can't believe I didn't call that. That would have been amazing. Great. Very expensive. Not as expensive as calling Lamar. Here we go. I knew this one would come in. Titans Tonk said, the Nintendo Tip and Hint Hotline. <laughs> they had that number plastered in every Nintendo Power magazine. Mama was furious. This is excellent. So the Nintendo Tip and Hint Hotline is, if you just can't beat Mega Man 2, you would call and there would be actual people whose jobs it was to sit at desks and be like, all right, so let me talk you through Zelda. What level are you on? What castle? Now you're gonna go left to get the key, and then you put a bomb there, and all right, did you do it yet? Okay, great, blow up that wall. Okay, uh-huh, uh-huh, now go through, get the map. Like, they would talk you through 8-bit Nintendo games on the phone, charging your parents exorbitant numbers, and it was magical. Not as magical as getting Lamar Jackson as your quarterback, nor as expensive, but Titans Tonk, you nailed it. Next, Houdane says, Okay, there was a music hotline you could call, request a song, and the music video would play on the TV channel with your name requesting, like early TRL. Buddy and I called for Baby Got Back to see what all the hype was about, worth getting grounded for $10. That's awesome. All right, there were a couple of those. One of them was called The Box, and I remember this well. Next tweet, let's see if anybody else went the music route. Pat Gallen, yes, okay, Pat Gallen, same thing. What saddens me is how kids won't know how stupid things like getting in trouble for requesting lightning crashes or this is how we do it for $3 a pop. Pat, you're all over it. You call in, you're like, yeah, can I get glycerine by Bush? And it costs your parents three bucks. Pointless exercise, the next tweet says sports phone. Sports phone was an amazing thing that goes back years where you would call up and get sports scores. Imagine just a Sunday at 2 2.30 p.m. and you'd call up and you'd get Packers Vikings. Packers 31, Vikings 13. They would tell you the scores because you had no clue and no other way how to get them because you're doing stuff. Great one. Next, do we have any more? Oh yeah. Look at Miss Cleo. <laughs> Miss Cleo was a psychic that you would call and she had the accent and she had the ridiculous outfit, mind and spirit. She was a telepsychic and she would tell you all about your fortune and love and money and business. Miss Cleo was amazing. Miss, you know what, maybe, is Miss Cleo still with us? I don't know, maybe we can find out. Lamar should call Miss Cleo and see if any teams are gonna call. Oh, Miss Cleo's not still with us. Well, wherever she is up there in that great uh, phone number in the sky, uh, just to close with this, I used to, uh, my dad had a car phone, like a lot of dads did in the day, and we used to call a number to, to get weather reports. You would call a weather and they would charge you just to tell you what the weather's gonna be. You could call a number to see what time it is. At the tone, it will be exactly 2.36 p.m. Beep! And then my dad, because he was a wild one, still is, would call a joke number. 
and the number was 1-900-876-JOKE, or 1-800-876-JOKE. And you would call, and for like $4, they would say, so a guy walks into a bar, and it was so dumb, and they had dumb sound effects, but we as kids loved it. Not as expensive as calling Lamar Jackson's hotline. If you wanna call Lamar Jackson, it's gonna be um, $180 million for the first minute, and $10 million for each additional minute. He's standing by, no problem. Make sure to get your owner and your general manager's position or permission before you call <laughs> and their position if they're into it for really, they need to be, have a strong position to get Lamar. Standing by, very expensive phone call. That number once again, 1-800-YES-LAMAR. Uh, I don't know if that numbers work out. $180 million for the first minute, $10 million for each additional minute. Get your owner and your general manager's permission before you call. Guys, let's get on to what's hilarious. It's really good. Jimmy Butler did something great. Yes, I'm talking about the NBA. I love the association. Um, using Nickelback as a motivational tactic is really good. Here's what happened. There's an ESPN article written on Saturday after the Heat lost to the Orlando Magic, Jimmy Butler. All right, so apparently it goes terribly, goes in the locker room. The ESPN article reads, quote, the sound of Nickelback coming from the portable speaker inside the Miami Heat locker room were in, un, unmistakable. As the rest of his teammates and Heat staffers quietly showered, got dressed, and picked over a post-game pizza spread, Jimmy Butler decided it was the right time to pump up the volume on his stereo and blast the familiar sounds of Chad Kroger's voice. Look at this photograph! Jimmy Butler, awesome. So he was basically putting them in timeout it's almost like kind of severe. You know how you hear like all these reports that prisoners in Guantanamo could be subject to like torture of playing crazy loud gospel music or heavy metal or something. Jimmy said, enough of this crap. We play like hell out there on the court. Give me the Kroger. Blast the Nickelback for these young guys in their early 20s and see how they feel about this while they have their pizza spread. Best part is this is a sequel. A sequel that's been seven years in the making. Like it's bleeping Avatar. This tweet from March 22nd, 2017. This goes back six years almost to the date. Cody Westerlin was re reporting on it. He tweets, coming off a brutal loss and before the Bulls 72nd game of the season, Jimmy Butler is jamming out to Nickelback's animals. Amazing. Why does Jimmy Butler have any attachment to Nickelback at all? Is he Canadian? <laughs> what, isn't he too young for Nickelback? But he does that as a thing now. He blasts it to his teammates after bad losses to either listen to something that he thinks is worse, either to punishment, or maybe, maybe he just likes it and that gets him back in where he needs to be mentally. Here's my take on Nickelback. Nickelback has been the go-to punching bag pinata joke for a good decade plus. It's what you go to for your lame humor about the crappiest band or something that sucks, and that's fine, and they've taken a place in that. I can't tell you how much respect I have for the guys from Nickelback, the fact that they have endured, the fact that they are wildly successful. I don't think they take themselves too seriously. I think they kind of roll with this punishment that they've taken for years and say, go ahead, yeah, you think our music sucks? Okay, fine, we're gonna tour the world, sell out venues, sell records, as we have for 20 plus years, as international, celebrated, decorated rock stars. But I'm, yeah, I'm sorry that you sitting there think we suck. I love that. You wanna know something about Nickelback? Oh, they're the worst band ever, they suck. Nickelback is one of the most commercially successful Canadian rock bands. They've sold more than 50 million albums worldwide. 50 million, that's 50 times platinum. Um, massive, massive success. Billboard ranked them in 2009 as one of the most successful rock groups ever. Massive success. You want to know when my whole tide changed on Nickelback? And I don't listen to their music. I, I don't, I've never purchased a Nickelback album. It's fine. It's like music you hear in the dentist's office. Who cares? It's harmless to me. People are so triggered by it. I think it's so funny. I saw a video clip from years ago where they went on stage somewhere in Europe. I don't know which country it was, but this crowd was razzing them. And I don't know, maybe they were an opening band or part of a festival or something. This crowd was screaming stuff at them, middle fingers, bleep you. They're throwing stuff on the stage. It's going really, really bad. Chad Kroger goes to the front of the stage and he says, listen, 
Do you want to hear some rock music or what? Or we're out of here. You want to? Like, it was confrontational. I just thought he was been in the beginning of the uh, stage, the front of the stage, on the mic. You want to hear some rock music or not? And they threw more stuff at him, and they screamed at him. And he said, bleep you, we're out of here. He walked off. The other band members raised middle finger, walk off. They didn't play anymore. They was done. I thought that was so badass. I thought it was really cool. I thought it was a great way to handle it. It's like balls to walk off. It's like balls to confront the, stand, the fans like that in a completely cards on the table way. Nothing, just like, listen, I don't care. If you, if, if you want us to leave, we're out of here. If you want to hear it, we'll play. You want us to leave, fine. Bleep you, we're out of here. I, I loved it. And you watch the video. Google uh, Nickelback walks off stage. I'm not saying that they're, they're Radiohead or the Beatles. Who cares? They are what they are. They've done it for 20 years. I think it is so, so lame and played and corny and stock to make Nickelback jokes. So I have, I don't listen to their music. I, I know Photograph and I know the first song, The Way You Remind Me. That's pretty much it. Kind of probably like you. But I also know that Jimmy Butler has a familiar relationship with Nickelback. I need him to answer questions about why. I need to. Because that is such a strange thing. You would think a guy playing Nickelback would be, I don't know, in his 40s, 30s. Jimmy Butler, why is an NBA player doing that? What do his teammates think? Do they even know what it is? Who is this guy screaming about photographs? I have no idea, but I love that he does it. It actually makes me root against his team. I hope that they lose by 70 in their next game so we can hear more Nickelback. I love it. That's it. That's what's hilarious. Guys, that's the show. It's a quick one today. Lean and mean. We did Rodgers. We did... Uh, great hotlines pertaining to Lamar Jackson, and we did a basketball story somehow about a Canadian rock band, a wildly successful Canadian rock band. I'm gonna throw a dart, you tweet the show, at KV Basement, go to the Skycam, let's go. I'm going over here now. If you've never seen the show before, if you've never heard the show before, this is very simple. I'm over at a real life dartboard that's about, I don't know, 12 feet away from where I stand. I throw a dart, whatever number it hits, there's a random topic the producers have put together to correspond to each number, whatever number I hit, I answer that topic, I get on the Peloton, and we're out of here. Today's topic will be number uh, eight. Number eight, right down here. Let's find out what we got. I don't see this ahead of time. I don't know what they are. Let's check it out. Number eight is favorite Robert De Niro role. Well, that's an easy one. Uh, Robbie, uh, uh, Robert De Niro in um, Rocky and Bullwinkle. Of course, he played Boris Badenov. Is that the character's name? No, that's not it. That's the low point of Robert De Niro. They actually got him in the Rocky and Bullwinkle movie to do a scene in which his character does doing a terrible accent like this, looks in the mirror and says, are you talking to me? He does a raging bull, or not a raging bull, a taxi driver homage. It's not great. My favorite Robert De Niro role is actually Cape Fear. Cape Fear, I think, might have been the first Robert De Niro movie I ever saw, and I saw it at a time when I was maybe seventh or eighth grade. And if you don't know the movie, it's a Scorsese movie he does with um, some other really good actors, Nick Nolte for one, and he plays this shredded, like uh, six pack, ripped arms, uh, mus uh, muscles, and this character named Max Cady, and he does this accent, and he's got long hair, and he's kind of handsome, and he's like a terrorizing stalker of Nick Nolte. And it's like there's a crazy scene he does with Juliette Lewis when she's like unbelievably young and it's all sexualized and it's uncomfortable, but his acting in it is so good. I like that he's the villain. You don't see a ton with De Niro as the villain. He's in fight scenes, he's in sex scenes. He does, he's just awesome, awesome. There's a lot of gifts of that movie in his role and it's normally about him laughing in the movie, smoking a cigar and watching the film Problem Child. That's just a sidebar. Max Cady, his role where he starts in prison and ends up on a houseboat. Um, it's not a, the easiest watch, some uncomfortable scenes, but his performance is so good. And just how often do you get to see ripped, shredded De Niro? It's not like when he's Lamada and Raging Bull, like he's got this boxer's frame. He is like full eight pack and he's wearing like these tiger striped bikini briefs. <laughs> it's crazy. Max Cady, Cape Fear, Robert De Niro. It's a great topic, love talking about that. Um, but that's it guys, great topics across the board today. I'm gonna go call the uh, time hotline to see exactly what time it is exactly, and I'm gonna call 876-JOKE while I'm at it. Thank you, love you, see yourself out, exit through the garage, close the door on your way out. See you tomorrow.